All right, so welcome to Math 383 Complex Analysis. I actually gave a small part of this lecture earlier today in 341 when we were doing the proof of the central limit theorem. So it's always nice when things align. What I want to do today is I want to talk about one of my favorite methods, you know, trying to approximate the values of certain intervals. And the question is why we want to approximate values of certain intervals. They often are the solution to various problems. In particular, uh, one of the general items we're going to see today is it's often easier to study an integral or a continuous problem versus a discrete problem. So when we look at n factorial, you should not be thinking initially that this is an integral to try to find its value, although we have seen from the gamma function the value of, or at least the potential value of shifting to this analytic analog that's defined for all inputs and not just one. This is a big theme in number theory and various other subjects of mathematics, replace the problem you're looking at with a continuous analog and then throw calculus out. Okay. There's a reason why we've spent all these years dealing with continuous functions and whatnot. So we'll talk a little bit more about you know, Sterling's formula. Uh, I realize that this is after a break, and so it's not a bad idea to just do a quick reset and let's just remind ourselves of things we've seen before, before we delve in at warp speed to you know, the new material. So we'll talk about Sterling's formula integral test review, We'll talk about a nice way to derive Stirling's formula from the central limit theorem. So I'll quickly sketch that proof. And then we'll talk about the main part of today, you know, the stationary phase critical points and using this to try to find the values of certain integrals. I have deliberately not reviewed my notes or the book or the previous lectures for this to try to put myself in an empty mindset as to how would you attack a problem like this? And then if time permits, we'll talk about uh, various other generalizations and related questions. And the other piece of intuition is coming from Taylor series. But if you have a nice situation, typically the higher order terms are eventually negligible. And that things can be well approximated by what's going on in the beginning. And then the question is just how many terms do you need is a function of how well do you want things approximated. Okay, so just to remind ourselves, the gamma function is defined as e to the negative x, x to the s minus one dx. Why do we write it as x to the s minus one? Yes. Yeah. So x to the s minus one dx. Oh, uh, wait, what did you say? So you can scale it. Is x to the s dx over x. dx over x scales nicely. So there's various types of transformations. You know, one transformation is zero, one into one infinity. This is the transformation x into, say, constant times x. We haven't really seen how this is useful yet. We will finally see that later today. So Stirling's formula says n factorial is about n to the n e to the minus n squared of 2 pi n. What does about mean? It means if you divide the left-hand side by the right-hand side and let n go to infinity, then this is going to go to 1. You're going to be a little bit more accurate, and you can start doing a series expansion. And depending on how much work you're willing to do, you can get you know, various terms deep. Now, these terms are much smaller than the main term, but they are still tremendous. You know, imagine it's a really bad day for the joint, you know, Jeff Bezos, uh, Bill Gates, Melinda Gates uh, community, and they lose 10%. Eh, let's have them lose 90% of their value. How are they doing relative to us? Phenomenal. They lose 99% of their value. How are they doing? Phenomenal. 99.9% of their value. How are they doing? Phenomenal. Okay. So just because it's a lower order term does not mean it's small. So always, 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 when you talk about size of an object, size relative to what? Size relative to the main term. So relative to the main term, when n is huge, you know, something of size one of n is much smaller, but it can still be on an absolute scale quite large. And it's important to remember that. So we did the poor man, the poor mathematician, Sterling. You know, we did basically the integral test. And when we did the integral test, we saw without too much trouble, it looked like something of size n to the n e to the minus n up to a factor of roughly size n. And if you use the geometric mean, which is not unreasonable because we want to take a logarithm, the geometric mean, well, when you take logarithms of that, that's essentially the same as the arithmetic mean. The factor of one and n, the geometric mean is square root of n. And so this gives you some idea that it might actually be n to the n e to the minus n square root of n up to some constant factor. We looked at the ratio of n plus one factorial over n factorial, 
And when we did this, we actually saw a reason as to why the E emerges. So we saw that you know, if you just plug in Sterling, uh, it actually does lead to you know, a ratio that would be of size n plus one. And you can see a little bit of why there might be an E, this one plus one over n to the n. And it gives you some idea of why the E shows up. When you're looking at Sterling's formula, you know, a couple of things should be worth remarking. You know, we have an E showing up and we have a pi, or better yet, a square root of two pi showing up. These are wonderful constants. And whenever you see them, you should start to think where, what might be looking in the background that's the cause of this. So when you see square root of two pi, what do you think of? Gaussian. Gaussian. You know, it's the normalization constant of the standard normal. If I give you two pi, what do you think of? Sorry? Not a square. Circle, right? Two pi, you think circle, you think perimeter, right? If I give you pi, what do you think? Of? I wouldn't think of angle. Could be the perimeter of a semicircle. And this is where units matter. What else could you be thinking of with pi? Area. If I give you four pi, what do you think of? surface area of the sphere. And so depending on what constants you see, this gives you some idea of what's going on. When I see that square root of two pi, I'm thinking maybe there's a Gaussian looking in the background. And maybe that's where the Stirling's formula comes from. We actually saw that there was a connection between the gamma function and the moments of the standard normal. So the 2m moment of the standard normal is 2m minus 1 double factorial. You can represent the moments of the standard normal in terms of the gamma function by doing a change of variable. It's a really good exercise to do. And so maybe it's not so surprising that they're going to play a role. But again, when you see things like this, it's pattern recognition. You have some idea of what you're trying to get to, and that can help you figure out what the proof is. As we talked about that, we talked about this. What I want to do is a quick proof from probability. So if you haven't seen all of probability, I will hopefully use only a small amount to make this self-contained. But if you have any questions, let me know. So we say X is a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda. If the probability that X takes on the value N, where N is a non-negative integer, is lambda to the N, E to the minus N over N factorial, and zero otherwise. So that's just what it means to be a Poisson random variable. It's not that hard to show that this sums to one. Basically, because if you sum, the sum of lambda to the n over n factorial is e to the lambda, and that cancels the e to the minus lambda. It's clearly non-negative, as long as lambda is greater than zero. So this is a probability distribution. It turns out with a little bit of calculation, uh, the mean is going to be lambda, and the variance is going to be lambda as well. So you can just do that calculation. And then if we have a bunch of independent, identically distributed random variables with mean and mu, um, variance sigma squared, and a little bit more, I'm not going to go into all the details, then the central limit theorem says that the sum converges to being normally distributed with mean n times mu and variance n times sigma squared. So this is the famous central limit theorem. And you, again, if you're interested, you can then go to the earlier class today, where we go through and give all the details of you know, how would you prove this modulus and results from complex analysis, but we actually know enough to have those results from complex analysis. So let's try to apply this in the special case of a Poisson random variable. Now, one thing that's really nice is if each xk is Poisson with parameter lambda k, then x1 plus xn is Poisson with parameter lambda 1 plus lambda n. And if all lambda k equals 1, then it is Poisson with parameter n. So this is a straightforward calculation. A good way to do this is to use convolutions. The probability density of the sum of independent random variables is the convolution of the densities. It's a nice calculation to do. It's a good way to test what we've seen on convolutions. Or you can just trust me and say that, look, if we sum a bunch of independent Poissons, you get a Poisson. And not surprisingly, the parameter of the sum 
is the sum of the parameters because the mean has to be the same. The mean of a sum is the sum of the means. This is linearity of expectation. Integration is a linear operator. Okay, so now I have the following. What is this and why do I care about this? Well, let's let XK be Poisson with parameter one. Let's let X be X1 plus Xn, which is gonna be Poisson with parameter N. So the probability that X equals N is n to the n, e to the minus n over n factorial. Why is this the case? Well, the probability that a Poisson random variable equals n is lambda to the n, e to the minus n over n factorial. I'm choosing a Poisson with parameter equals n. That's the most natural place to look at. I'm looking at the probability that it takes on the value of the mean. So I get n to the n, e to the minus n over n factorial. Does this look like anything we give a shit about today? Right? Yeah, the bottom is n factorial, which you want to estimate, and the top is the beginning, the n to the n, e to the minus n. So you can see that we're really close already. What am I doing? Well, I look at this integral, and this is basically the area under the standard normal. No, no, I'm sorry, not the standard normal. This is the area under a normal. Which normal? What is the mean of this normal? Where is it centered? N. And what is the variance of this normal? N. You know, it's e to the negative x minus mu squared over two sigma squared. So this is, you know, basically almost every letter today is an N right now. It's the normal with mean N and variance N. So normal with mu equals n, sigma squared equals n. Well, by the central limit theorem, the sum of independent Poisson random variables with parameter one converges to being normally distributed with mean n and variance n. So if I want to estimate the probability that I equal n, that should be given by the area under the normal. Well, I have to be careful because the normal is continuous and the Poisson is discrete. So what do I mean when I say the probability that X equals N? I mean, my Poisson random variable is at least N minus a half, and at most N plus a half. That's the probability under the normal that should be associated to the probability that the Poisson equals N, is break things up into chunks of one. So I find the area under the curve from N minus a half to N plus a half. Well, I'll just change variables. I'll let you know, t be x minus n. So I have the integral of e to the negative t squared over 2n from negative a half to a half. I just have to evaluate this integral. Right? Anybody want to estimate that integral for me? You can estimate this in your head. Yes. Yeah, just one over two pi n. Why? Because what is the integral itself approximately? One. If you look, if n is large, t is between minus a half and a half. So note e to the negative t squared over 2n is approximately one as n goes to infinity. So the integral is approximately one over square root of two pi n times one. So n to the n, e to the minus n over n factorial is approximately one over square root of two pi n. Therefore, n factorial is approximately n to the n, e to the minus n square root of two pi n. What would you do if you wanted a better estimate? What could you do? What if I wanted a better estimate? What could I do? Yeah, I could estimate the integral better. So 
estimate integral better, but need information on how you converge to being normally distributed. So without more information, I actually can't make it that much better because I just know that it's converging to being normally distributed. If I want to start getting a refined estimate, this is not going to be good enough because I need to know well, what's the error in the rate of convergence. Yes. But if I do within three quarters of n, that's going to impact either n minus one or n plus one. Yeah. If you look at what's going on, here is n, here's n plus one, here's n minus one. And when I do it like this, at n minus a half and n plus a half, these are going to be the points that are clo the closest integer to them are n. I should assign the area under the curve to correspond to the probability that my discrete random variable is n. Again, as long as you take any interval of size one, it doesn't really matter which way you do it. If you want to bias a little bit to the left or the right, it's not going to matter. The main thing is that it has to be an interval of size one, is that we have to basically say, I've got a discrete process and I've got a continuous process. I want to approximate the discrete with the continuous. What does it mean to say that my discrete value is n? Well, it means really I can say it's anything between n minus a half and n plus a half. And that would be corresponding to the point n. So if I did a better job estimating the interval, I could get something that's more accurate. But since I don't know how rapidly it's converging to the Gaussian, I can't actually then translate that directly into something better. So this is only going to give me the main term. And only. Okay. Yeah. That's not bad. It's a nice application of the central limit theorem. And it shows you that just because you prove a result for one reason does not mean you can't use it for something else. Yeah. The central limit theorem was not proved to estimate n factorial. It was used to try to estimate things in statistical inference. But here is a nice consequence. Because this must be true for any distribution, if we take a nice distribution, there's some really nice consequences. Okay. So now uh, I want to just quickly review a few facts from Taylor series. If anybody's interested in the mathematical code, I can give it to you. I've just pasted it up here. It's not that bad to write something like this. I've actually you know, calculated something that will do Taylor series expansions of various functions. This is going to do cosine. I have chosen to display what is going on at the point x equals zero. You could, of course, do this at any point that you want. And this is looking at the zero, second, fourth, and sixth Taylor series approximations to cosine of the order. You can see the Taylor series approximation of a degree zero polynomial is not great. How about a degree two polynomial? Is it doing a good job? I think it's doing a perfectly fine job if you're close to zero. What is the definition of close? Well, even if you're between minus one and one, I think it's actually doing a fine job. You know, because minus one is around over here. So between minus one and one, it's actually pretty good. It's not good in the entire range minus pi to pi. But from minus one to one, it's doing a pretty good job. If I look at the fourth order, I've almost got it up to two, up to minus two, two. Right? But again, I really need to go from minus pi to pi. So not quite far enough yet. What if I take the sixth order? Getting closer. You know, I'm almost there with the sixth order. So here's the 24th order and the 28th order. There is a reason why I stop doing every two why I'm doing you know, every four here. If you do the 26, it's actually gonna be coming down a little bit in terms of how things go because of this, the alternating sign. Is the 28th order approximation better than the 24th approximation? Yes, not surprising. Is it significantly better between minus pi and pi? No, I mean, on this scale, I really can't see a difference between minus pi and pi of the two. Is that the high order terms are not really having much of an impact. And this is the general idea, this is the general theme, that if you have a good process, 
the small values are eventually going to control what goes on. One of the reasons we love Poisson summation is it converts a slow decaying sum to a rapidly decaying sum where you can often approximate it by just one term. And so it's equivalent to then saying we only need to really look at one term. So depending on what problem you're looking at, it's a different decision as to how many terms do you have to look at to have a reasonable confidence that you know what's going on and what is your scale. You know, what is the margin for error? Um, let's say you are deciding to watch the game War Games. Who is familiar with that? Right. What do you play in War Games? What's your choice to play? I'm sorry? Global thermonuclear war. That's the choice. You, know, you could have played tic-tac-toe, you could have played chess, but no, you decided to play global thermonuclear war. And it turns out it's not a game. Uh, you and the computer are actually about to launch nuclear weapons and destroy the world. It turns out that there was a slight error in the computer's targeting algorithm, and it's off by 15 feet. I'm sorry, we should probably use meters. It's off by 15 meters as it targets the nuclear bombs in terms of where they land. Does being off by 15 meters matter? No, not in global thermonuclear war. Let's say you're an umpire at a baseball game or a football game, and you have some uncertainty by about you know, two centimeters. Does that matter? Yes. So again, very similar to main term versus low order term. The absolute number is not what's important. What's important is the scale of that number relative to other items. And so when I'm looking at something like this, I'm asking, what is my error? Well, relative to what? How important is this going to be? So how many terms do I need is going to be a function of what I'm looking at. What level of accuracy is sufficient for the problem? You want to get a sense of how much work do I have to do? Is it enough to just get the main term? Or do I need to estimate how quickly things are converging? So it's a great, great point to take away from all of this. And again, one of the things I want you to get out of this class is really thinking about how to attack problems and what calculations to do. When you're writing up papers, you often write things up and you don't prove the most general result, you prove the result that you need for your application. Did I mention the time I was asked to referee a person's paper because they quoted my theorem in this class? I'll just do it very quickly. So yes, the person referenced one of my theorems in his paper. This was his PhD thesis. I had written a paper that came out afterwards and I had you know, seen it, I, I knew him, I had seen a copy of his thesis and I needed one of his results, but I generalized it a little bit because I needed the lower order term. And so my paper came out in print before his. I said, this is a simple generalization of one of his you know, theorems in the thesis. I just calculated the next lower order term. But when it was time for the journal to come to a referee for the paper, they gave it to me because he then cited my paper, which was a you know, nice little circular argument. You know, should he have written things a little bit more generally in his thesis? Well, what he needed at the time was only the main term. But it was so easy to get the next term. You could say it might be worthwhile to just put things in a little bit more generality to have it there. If it makes the argument much harder to follow, however, people often look at simpler cases to make the paper readable. Or you write a survey article that focuses on simple special case, and then you have the more general journal article that handles things in the greater generality. Right. There is no way to talk about Taylor series expansions without talking about our old friend e to the negative one over x squared. So just for definiteness, you know, here are four snapshots of this function. You know, for the first one, looking in the interval like minus 10 to 10, you know, it looks like it's small, but nothing, you know, too abnormal. We zoom in a little bit, we zoom in a little bit. And on, you know, the last one, we're going from minus 0.2 to 0.2. And we're talking about values of size on the order of 10 to the negative 10. You know, just to give you a sense of how quickly this function crashes down. You know, when we're at negative 0.5 to 0.5, you know, we're less than 0.1, but you know, maybe more than 0.02. Well, not maybe 0.02. You know, it's not horrible. You know, it's still a number that you can talk about. You know, at this point, you're trying to talk about something of the size 10 to the negative 10, 10 to the negative 11. You know, again, getting a sense of what is the scale. Right, so what I want to do is I want to talk about now the method of stationary phase, critical points, and we're going to apply this to Stirling. This is a tremendous subject. There is you know, days of lectures I could give on this. I really only want to do one day because I want to showcase a lot of applications of complex analysis. So the first is, let's just argue a little bit informally. 
So here is n factorial, the m of n plus one, about e to the negative x, x to the n integrating from zero to infinity. The nice thing is by looking at gamma of n plus one, we don't have that pesky, you know, exponent negative one. So my question is, where is the integrand largest? Anybody have any idea how we find where the integrand is largest? Graph it and hope for the best. Unfortunately, there's been an electromagnetic pulse. All of our graphing calculators have been destroyed. Take a derivative. So let's let f of x be e to the negative x, x to the n, f prime of x. So first I take the derivative of e to the negative x. So negative e to the negative x, x to the n, plus n e to the negative x, x to the n minus one. So I can pull out an e to the negative x, I can pull out an x to the n minus one. And if I've done the calculation correctly, I get n minus x. Yes. So where is my function going to be largest? So the integrand is largest out. Yeah. So largest at x equals n, boundary is okay. Yeah. As x goes to zero or infinity, the integrand goes to zero. Okay, so when x equals n, the integrand is largest. What do we get for the value of the integrand? So at x equals n, f of x is equal to n to the n e to the minus n. And so if I wanted to approximate the interval, the question is how far can I move away from n and have the function be approximately n to the n e to the minus n? So how would you try to figure out how far you can travel? Sorry, that's what we need to do. You have to tell me what is the correct skill. Do you think I can move an entire unit? You know, what do you think would happen if I move a whole unit? So let's look at f of x plus one. That would become e to the, uh, sorry, not x plus one, n plus one. That would be e to the negative n minus one. And then we would have n plus one to the n. So that's e to the minus n, e to the minus one, and then n plus one to the n, I can write that as n to the n, one plus one over n to the n, right? So this is e to the minus n, n to the n, one plus one over n to the n, e to the minus one. What is this approximately? One. Approximately one if n is large. So what this has told me is I can actually take a step of size one to the right and the integrand really hasn't changed. I can simply do a step of one to the left and it really hasn't changed. Well, this is good. How much is n to the n to the minus n off from Sterling by? What is it off by? Square root of two pi n. I damn well better be able to move one step without seeing a tremendous drop. So I might actually expect to be able to move on the order of square root of n. We could try, let's let f of n plus n to the c, where c is less than a half. Let's see what would happen if we did that. We would then have e to the negative n minus n to the c. And then we would have n plus n to the c to the n. So that's going to be e to the minus n, n to the n, e to the minus n to the c. And then we'd have 1 plus n to the c over n to the n. 
what is one plus n to the c over n to the n where c is less than half? Do you still believe, well, let me, sorry, let me, yeah. Do you still believe I can approximate that with maybe e to the n to the c? So let's be a little bit careful. So we have e to the negative n to the c, one plus n to the c over n to the n. How should I understand this? What should I do to try to understand this? I could take a log, right? Right? Really, just write on your notes. If Professor Miller is asking a question, flip a coin. If it's head, say log. Almost always, that is a good answer for what should we do. You know, whenever there is a product, you know, I want this to be instinctive. And yes, if you're ever volunteering and doing math with your third graders and teaching them how to multiply, you know, taking the log is bad. In general, however, in upper level math classes, if you see a product, what should you do? Take logs. And so I will actually switch to red because this is so important. Take log. Okay. And so now, if we start to take logarithms, what will we need to understand the log of one plus n over c over n to the n? We're going to have to use Taylor series. So if we take logs, we get negative n to the c from the first one, plus the log of one plus n to the c over c with an n coming outside from taking the log, right? n to the c over n, yes, thank you. And the log of one plus x is x minus x squared over two, plus x cubed over three minus yada, yada, yada. So this is minus n to the c plus n. And now let's do the log and let's expand that. So the first term is going to be n to the c over n. And then the next term is gonna be minus n to the two c over n squared plus n to the three c over n cubed, the two and the three minus n to the four c over four n to the fourth and so on and so on. So it's minus n to the c. Oh, good, look, n times n to the c over n, the n's cancel, and it's gonna be plus n to the c, minus n to the two c over two n, plus n to the three c over three n squared, minus dot, 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 dot. Well, if c is less than a half, what can you tell me? If C is less than a half, what does this go to? It goes to zero. So it can move on the order of N to the C away with C less than one half. So this is telling me, I expect it to be maybe of size, yes. Yeah. Well, because if c is less than a half, n to the 2c, the exponent is less than one. So when I divide by n, I have something that goes to zero. And the next term is going to go to zero even faster, and the term after that's going to go to zero even faster. And so my intuition, because I know it's supposed to be the square root of 2 pi n, that told me, let me try doing c less than a half. If I didn't know that, then I would just have c as an arbitrary exponent, do this calculation, and then I would say, ah, as long as c is less than a half, this converges, I can move anything up to there. If you want it to be a little bit fancy, you could then try uh, n plus square root of n over say maybe like log n instead of n plus n to the c. You try to play games like that to see just how far can I push them. But this is telling us that you expect it now to be of size n to the n e to the minus n times something of size maybe square root of n maybe a little bit more, but as we start going away further, you know, the function's decaying, 
So I'm expecting maybe to get less of the integration. What I'm trying to show you is that just by doing these simple crude arguments, we can often get a good sense of what the answer is. And again, you know, going forward in life, if you need a result from complex analysis, what are you going to do? Are you going to rely on the fact that you've memorized and completely internalized everything from the semester? No, this is the 21st century. What are you going to do? Google it, download an illegal copy of a textbook, download a legal copy of a textbook, you know, something like that, and you will find the resources. So in terms of just spending class time just doing facts, this is not the best use of class time. It's much better to spend some time talking about how should you approach a problem like this. I love having pre parameters. Pre parameters are wonderful, give you a sense of what you can do. Okay, any questions on this estimation? So, this is not a proof of still. The question then is can we make this a little bit more rigorous? How far can we go? Can we get the square root of two pi? But we saw it easily we can move on the order of one, two, three. That's no problem. We saw we could even move into the C, where C is less than a half. We might even be able to do square root of n over log n. And then maybe you could do square root of n over log log n. Maybe square root of n over log 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 n. And you can start playing games like that. How many people have read Rudin's, you know, baby Rudin, blue book, Principles of Mathematical Analysis? All right, there's a beautiful passage where they talk about trying to find a boundary between convergence and divergence of series. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about the rigorous attempt. So let's consider we have an integral of the form uh, e to the minus s p of x c of x dx. So p is going to be real valued, and we'll assume c is real valued as well. We will look at the case where s is real. You can look at, of course, the case when s is imaginary. And typically, as s goes to infinity in magnitude, if it's imaginary, there's going to be a tremendous amount of oscillation in this integral. And you would expect that most things away from where p of x is zero won't really contribute. Well, instead of p of x being zero, where p of x is near a minimum. So we are going to assume that p prime at x naught is zero, but p double prime of x naught, p double prime of x naught is greater than zero. Well, that should be um, throughout all of a b. It shouldn't be. It should be just p double prime of x, not p double prime of x naught, right? It makes no sense to say p double prime of x naught is greater than zero for the whole region. So this is a typo in the textbook. I can't erase it because unfortunately it is in the book. I can't do that. Okay. And so p double prime is greater than zero in the region. What does it mean? If p double prime is greater than zero, it means the function is convex up. So if you look at phi prime, this means phi prime is increasing. And if phi prime is increasing, what does that mean about the function? So it changes a global minimum. So I'm looking at this plot. Um, does this plot make sense? So we clearly have, you know, p prime of x naught is zero. Does this look like phi double prime is greater than zero in this region? Possibly, because remember, this is not saying that phi prime of x is positive in the region. It just means phi prime is increasing. So phi prime could start off negative and then get progressively less negative. And in fact, if you were to plot phi prime, so here is phi prime. What is the value of phi prime at x naught? It's zero. And if it's if phi prime is increasing, then that means phi prime has to be negative before zero, and it has to be positive after zero. So I actually know that this is roughly the shape of my power. 
So I have a global minimum at zero. And as I move a little bit away, the function has to be logical. You know, I don't have a region where phi prime is zero. Okay. But you know, one of the things that's often confused is just because phi prime is positive doesn't mean the function itself is positive. It just means that you know, phi prime could have started off as negative. We know that phi prime is increasing. So we know the plot looks something like this. Okay. So this is the general framework. And so the big result is that under the above assumptions, then the following integral is equal to the following expression, where a is the square root of two pi c of x naught over b double prime of x naught to the one half. So the first question is when you see something like this, is this reasonable? Well, essentially, all the action should be happening near x naught. As you move just a little bit away of x naught, the function changes. Okay, so c is smallest at x naught. We have an e to the negative s c of x. So as you move a little bit away from x naught, because s is going to infinity, you will be a little bit larger than phi of x naught. And if you're a little bit larger than phi of x naught when you multiply by s, that magnifies it tremendously. So if you move a little bit away from x naught, we expect that the contribution should be negligible because by being magnified by s, it becomes very, very small. All right. So the action basically happens near x naught. So near x naught, C of X is basically what? C of X naught. Okay, so that's looking reasonable as well. Now we've got the phi double prime in the square root of two pi. So should we take a walk of it? We do have a product here, but the C of X is really just a constant. It's really just a C of X naught. What, when you look at this constant A, what does A suggest might be working in the background? The Gaussian. Yeah, it looks like maybe there's a Gaussian going on because we have the square root of two pi. So let's write C of X as c of x naught plus c prime of x naught x minus x naught plus c double prime of x naught x minus x naught squared over two factorial plus something of size x minus x naught cubed. So big O just means an or a term of order x minus x naught cubed. So if x is close to x naught, X minus X naught cube is much, much smaller than X minus X naught. Well, C of X naught is constant, so it doesn't really matter. So what that would mean is I would just pull out a e to the negative S times P of X naught. Oh, look, e to the negative S phi of X naught is just pulled right out. Well, what that's basically saying is don't be an idiot. Take your function phi, subtract the constant term, and just pull it out. It has no role in what goes on. Right? There's no dependence action shift by any constant. So the e to the negative s phi of x naught term is quite reasonable. The phi prime of x, well, what's phi prime of x naught? Zero. So what this is saying is after pull out the phi prime, I'm sorry, the, the phi of x naught, we have one half phi double prime of x naught x minus x naught squared. When you put that in, that's going to give you an e to the negative s p double prime x naught x minus x naught squared over two. What does that look like? Gaussian. We have an x minus x naught squared. This looks like a Gaussian centered at x naught. 
how do you write the Gaussian? It's e to the negative x minus mu squared over two sigma squared. Oh, yay, we, we even have a two down below. So sigma squared, the variance is just one over S phi double prime of X naught. And that's essentially what we're getting over here. So the big question is um, when you look at this, We've got the square root of phi double prime of x naught. That's good. So looks like a normal with mean x naught and variance one over s phi double prime of x naught. Well, I've got the phi double prime of x naught to the one half. That's great, you know, for like my standard deviation. But where's the s to the one half? Yeah, so I'm writing it as a over s to the one half. You know, I'm not including the s to the one half in a because a is supposed to be my universal constant that depends only on the functions going on at x naught. It doesn't depend on s. I'm trying to isolate out the s dependence. That's why I have the e to the negative s p of x naught over here. This is why I have the s to the one half over here. When you look at this, it's basically saying we have a uh, Gaussian Right? And this Gaussian has mean x naught. It has variance one over s p double prime of x naught. We don't have the one over square root of two pi. That's why we have to multiply by square root of two pi because we need that one over square root of two pi to make it a normal distribution. So the rest of the proof just goes to now showing that we can take the integral from a to b and basically say, you know what? We can just localize the integral to be close to x naught. Let me just sketch. And then we'll do this in detail tomorrow. Sketch. The integral from a to b is approximately the integral from x naught minus blah to x naught plus blah. OK. What is that range? How far do you think we go? What do you think it depends on? Yeah. So. The bounds depend on s. As s, get, as s gets very, very large, what do you think happens to the bounds? As s increases, the bounds what? They decrease. Because as s increases, if you move a little bit away from x naught, remember, phi of x has a global minimum at x naught. It's a strict minimum. If you move a little bit away, phi of x is larger. So if you move just a little bit away, you then get magnified by that big S. So we would expect that as you move a bit, the bounds decrease and you get tighter. So tighter about x naught. And so what we say is, look, instead of integrating from a to b, it's OK to integrate in this window about x naught. And then. The integral from x naught minus lower to x naught plus upper of our approximation is then approximately the integral from minus infinity to infinity of our approximation. So the error you make in then extending the new integral to infinity is very negligible. So this point is really worth driving home because this is how a lot of these analytic arguments work. You start off with a integral over a whole region and you basically say, you know what? 99.9% of the integral doesn't matter. Let me focus on the small part that matters. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate my integrand in that small part. And then what I'm going to say is, well, look, I've got my main term coming from the phi double prime, and then I have the order of x minus x naught cube. I show the order of x minus x naught cube doesn't matter. And so I remove that from my integral. And so I've cleaned up my integral, and it's no longer the same integral. It's now an approximate integral. And then I take that approximated integral and then I expand that to minus infinity infinity. And then the error in doing that is negative. And so you do things in a step process. You first say I can restrict. And then in this restricted region, I can then tailor expand. I can throw away most of the terms in the tail expansion. And then once I now have something nice, 
then I can change my integration view over the whole region to make it nice and just resort to what we know. So we'll finish this and we'll go through this in detail on Wednesday. Yes. It's the, the assumptions is just that phi prime of x naught is zero, phi double prime of x is greater than zero in the region. So that we have an absolute minimum. We are saying we have a function with these properties. Real value. Yep. We're, we're saying that we have a function with these properties. If your function doesn't have these properties, you can't use this method. So both the function and the Yes. Um, we, we don't actually need infinitely differentiable. Um, that's just for simplicity. We just need all the integrals to converge as long as C has some reasonable decay. So a lot of times you know, you'll just make things a little bit easy because in applications, it's not going to be a problem. But we just need all the integrals to converge. And so as long as phi prime of x naught is zero and phi double prime of x naught is greater than zero in the region, if you move just a little bit away on an absolute scale from x naught, it's negligible. So that means we can only move in a small amount relative to s. Because we're multiplying it by s, once we move over, you know, like one over s or one over square root of s, the hope is that's now negligible. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>